Gary Wilson and welcome to this week's live Path to Profit webinar. Uh, welcome aboard to all of you who, from whatever program you're in, whether you're doing the flipping program, the rental program, investor agent program, we've even got some people in here from the wholesaling program. I don't think we have any current property management students. Um, we did last year, but I don't, I don't, we haven't really pushed that too much. Um, in fact, we're going to be rolling that out uh, in the winter time. So in any case, for all of you who are relatively new, usually, we, you know, we do this every single week. Um, three out of four weeks, three weeks out of the month, sometimes it's four depending on how many, uh, how long the month is. Um, we, we do three or four regular webinars, and we have, and then the other week we have one special guest. Tonight happens to be one of those nights. So Mike Chodron is going to be, is on right now, and he's going to show us something he developed uh, for his own purposes and he wrote a book about it and it has to do with how do you find information in your area on properties on people so forth and so on so uh, but regardless whether you're you're if you're new and if there's your first webinar or second webinar whatever the case is or 150th webinar just remember that we we are live we are recording um, and everybody is in mute mode by default okay um, we can unmute you from, and we do unmute you from time to time. So if you have questions for Mike, and Mike would want me to unmute you tonight, I'll unmute you. Okay, I'll monitor the questions. So Mike, every couple minutes, as I see a natural break, or, or kind of intervene and or intersperse, excuse me, and we'll go over some questions. Um, and also, guys, always keep in mind, please, please look at the email that comes out the next day from Beverly, because it not only gives you the recording of this, uh, it also gives you some um, some information like upcoming webinars. Um, uh, updates to the system, okay? Um, we also will do updates to the material. So one update I want to give you guys is, lo and behold, surprise, surprise, I don't know if hopefully Cedric are on, that cash report that we actually started talking about over a year ago, we've, we do, we've had it in place as of last week. I had introduced it to everybody. Well, as of today, there is a screen on the silver level membership section of the My Investment Services website. So you go into My Investment Services, click on Members area, on that next screen you'll see where you can log into the Silver Level. By default, all of you are Silver Level. And in there you're going to see a new screen, a new panel. You can type in your area, it's usually town or zip code or something like that, and how far back you want to go to get a report of all the people who've paid cash for properties in your area. Okay? Really, really important information. A lot of you have been asking for this for quite some time, so I'm, I'm pleased to announce that as of today, it is live. Now, I haven't seen it myself, <laughs> so, um, but apparently it's live. I just got the email about an hour ago from the web developer, so congratulations to all you guys for being patient and asking for this because we've, and by the way, you don't have to pay a dime for it, at least right now. The agreement is this. We're able to do this for the time being. Um, any of you are current students, while your year is in progress, you're not going to have to pay for it. Um, once your year is up, you know you can stay on through, through the membership. You can it's like 97 bucks a month, and you get all this stuff. You get the course, all the the um, everything online there, and of course the community site. And now you've also got the, the access to the cash buyers report. Um, and I just want to sweeten the pot here a little bit. We now also have the ability to give you a list of private lenders in your area. It's We don't have it live yet. I've got it. It's going to take probably another month or so, but just, just know this. It's coming your way. So whether you're an agent or an investor, if you're if you're been figuring out how can you get um, financing, we're going to show you how to get a report. We're going to give you a report of private lenders in your area on demand. Whenever you ask for it, you just, just let us know. We're going to give it to you. Um, speaking of private lending, in, in December, our, our guest is going to be a private lender from New York and they lend it off all 48 uh, I believe all 48 of the lower 48 states I don't know that they lend in Canada uh, even banks that are in US and Canada actually operate as separate entities I mean they, they kind of have to so uh, we'll find out when he's online what the deal is for Canada uh, for all the Canadians on board here so in any case awesome awesome news um, I think that's about it for housekeeping without further ado let me introduce Mike. So, Mike, if you want to go ahead and take over here, but if you wouldn't mind, uh, for the folks who don't know you, just fill in a little bit on who you are, what you're doing, where you are, um, you know, how and why, that basically who, what, where, when, why, how, 
and then go ahead and, and show us what you've got. And at the end, I know you've got a nice little surprise for everybody, and I appreciate you pulling that together. So welcome aboard, man. I think I speak for everybody when I say we appreciate you taking your, your precious time away from your family to do this on a, on a Wednesday evening. So welcome aboard, Mike. Absolutely. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Figured um, I haven't used GoToWebinar as a presenter before, but hopefully everybody can see me. I'll pop on here just to introduce myself. Um, as Gary said, my name is Mike Shogren. Um, I met Gary through um, Mastermind Group that we're a part of and got to talking and he was generous enough to, to come and talk to our group about uh, multifamily and um, so happy to return the favor and come and uh, talk to you guys and share a little bit of stuff that, again, I just put together for my own benefit and um, I'm glad some other people are getting some use out of it. So um, I'm a CPA by trade. So minor disclaimer I'm a CPA I'm not your CPA so anything I say tonight isn't you know tax or legal advice um, just my own opinion and hopefully you guys will get some value out of it but um, you know I've been in working as a CPA for about 10 years now and ironically I've spent an insane amount of money on formal education um, all the way up to the MBA and CPA and nobody ever taught us how to invest in real estate which is absolutely insane and um, Probably four years ago, I read a book, like I'm sure many of you, called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and that just totally blew me away. And since then, I've just been relentlessly chasing passive income streams, primarily through real estate. So, um, you know, I met my first mentor after going to a couple meetups. I was very fortunate to, to meet this man who kind of took me under his wing. He's got, he's been in the game for about 18 years. He's got over 8,000 units all over the country, and he happens to live half an hour away from me and was gracious enough to take me under his wing and kind of teach me his stuff. And his primary focus is around market research and really understanding market cycles and when to get in, when to get out, what strategies to use in each type of market. And um, as I got further and further kind of down the rabbit hole with him, I started talking to other investors. There were a lot of core principles that they all focused on, a lot of key indicators that they look for. Um, so that's what we'll go through tonight. And then I'm, I have a horrible memory, so I needed to write it all out. And he told me all the indicators that I needed to use, but he didn't tell me where to find them. And anytime I tried to find them, there were different service providers that were charging anywhere from 500 to insane amounts. I met a guy at a meetup that pays $40,000 a year for his market research subscription. So, you know, as a newbie starting out a few years ago, I didn't have that kind of money, obviously. So I had to figure it out on my own. And I went directly to the sources, all the different government websites, and I spent months, literally, if any of you have tried to go to some of these government websites, I swear somebody pays them to make it impossible so that you have to pay for the data. Um, but I went through it piece by piece and um, put together a step-by-step -step guide that um, I'll send everybody a link to that you can get all the access for free. Um, I'll, I'm not going to charge anybody for that. Um, and hopefully it'll save you a ton of time, a ton of money on pulling together all the research that you need to do. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to hop off and I'm going to pull up my presentation and we will go through that. So from here, okay. So what we are covering tonight, we're going to go through market cycles. We're going to talk about those key indicators. Um, as my mentor always told me, it's basically your crystal ball into the future. Um, and then we'll go through where to find the data and where to get my book, The Ultimate Guide to Free Market Research, for free. Um, but before we get started, you know, I, I always like to try and simplify things. So in order to kind of summarize what I've learned from a lot of my mentors that have been in the game a lot longer than I have, it, real estate really breaks down into three different things. And at the core is, is really knowing your market. So you've got to know your market, and then you've got to build your team, and then you've got to know your asset or your property. If you're missing any of these elements, or if, if any of them aren't rock solid, then the deal or the success is, is, is um, not, not anywhere near where it should be. You're just asking for trouble. And at the core of that is your market. So that's what we're going to be focusing on tonight. So location, location, location. We've all heard that phrase before. And I know when I first started, I was really overwhelmed because my mentor had places all over the country and I was trying to figure out where to start. So um, trying to pick a market basically comes down to understanding basic economics. So any of you who have taken an economics class 
will have seen this in the past. Basically, it's price and quantity. So there's this line in the middle where they both cross. So let me try and put this into more basic terms for real estate. So you've got your supply, which is all the properties, and then you've got your demand, which is people that need to live in those properties, right? So what drives market cycles is essentially job growth. So when the primary factor that was taught to me was to always look for job growth. Anything over 2% um, for the last two years or more is a good sign. And the reason for that is when new jobs come in, people move to the area because they need to fill those jobs. So as new jobs come in, more people move, but until the housing supply increases, there's increased demand, but the supply is stagnant. So what that does is it forces prices, right? So if I live outside of Boston right now, there's a ton of companies moving into Boston. So as a simple example, say that there were to keep it simple, say 100,000 people, obviously there's more than that, but if there was 100,000 people and 100,000 units available, we'd be in perfect um, price quantity, you know, everything would be filled. But if we had 100,000 people fighting over 50,000 apartment units, you know, it drives the demand up. Because if I go and I say, all right, I'll, you know, it's 1,100 bucks a month or 1,500 bucks a month, and then the next guy says, well, I'll give you 1,800 bucks a month. So it, it creates this pricing war, right? But what happens is, is construction comes in and they start building more and more units and more units and more units and more units until eventually that supply overtakes the amount of people that are there and then there's more supply than there are people. And that at a super, super high level is what drives market cycles, right? It's just basic supply and demand. If you've got more units and you've got people, then you've got to offer concessions to fill your units. Because if hey, somebody hasn't written, go ahead, Gary. Hey, Mike. Um, I, I'm, you, it might be the view you're in, but your slides, at least everybody that we're seeing, they're still on. You're still on slide one. Oh, really? On your presentation. Oh, yeah, man. Yes. So, so I wonder. Uh, let's, let me, let me, oh, there it goes. Bingo. It just changed to supply increase, bring and demand to equilibrium. <laughs> um, you know what? I'll just kind of. So can you see this basic supply and demand? I'll recap it again yeah. real quick, right? So yeah, I can see that. Okay, I just didn't know if you if you go and I'm not sure what what platform you're using. I don't recognize it right here, but uh, uh, I don't see the. Um, yeah, this is just PowerPoint for Mac, so maybe it looks a little different. PowerPoint for Mac. Okay, it does look different. Then I see the slideshow button up top, but um, but that's so okay you, as long as you're. You're, it looks like you're okay now. Now? I'm sorry. What's that? Are you just seeing the slides now? Well, no, I can see your actual like if I'm I'm seeing it as if I'm the presenter. Like I'm not seeing I'm seeing on the left hand side all your slides, hmm. and in the panel I'm seeing the actual one that's the, that is current. Um, so it's not actually in slideshow format. Um, How about now? Yeah, still seeing the slides on, and that's okay. It's it's okay to because hmm, we can see interesting. Uh, whatever you just have to click on it manually. Then I guess perhaps I'm not sure. Or keep sliding through manually because it's not going through automatically. It looks like. All right. Um, well, sorry about that, guys. A little technical difficulty, but we'll make it work. That's okay. Hey, we're okay, man. Everybody's following along, and and uh, <laughs> I was sitting there, you know, best. I was thinking, well, there's a that's a lot of information for for the slide one, and I saw the some of the comments. I thought, okay, I see what's going on here. I oh saw man. Others. Okay. Yeah. So I had my basic economics 101 here. Yeah. Price, you know, demand and supply, equilibrium. So. As I was mentioning, so for real estate, a bunch of people move to a city, creates demand for housing, then construction takes over. So that's forcing the prices up of all these apartments, right? So you want people moving into your city if you've got an apartment building. And then what happens is, is all the construction companies come out and they start building all these new units. And then eventually they build more units than there are people, and then the market turns over. Yeah. Right? So that's basic supply and demand at a super high level. Obviously, there's a little more that goes into it than that, but at a very, very high level, that's what happens. Okay, so okay. you've got these different market cycles or phases of a market. So it starts down here with the recovery. So, right, so we had the big crash in 08, 09, and then as we came out, we had this wave that's coming up, and we recovered, and then we get into this expansion phase, and then eventually as things get overbuilt, another – macroeconomics factors kick in, the cycle starts over again and properties have to start offering concessions and the whole cycle starts over again. And this happens every 
eight to 12 years. There's a, just a giant market cycle. And it's rhythm, rhythmic. You can look at it over history and you can see that this is just the natural ebbs and flows of the business. Now, what we can do is follow some of these key economic indicators. Again, it all comes back to supply and demand, right? So we've got the supply indicators and we've got the demand indicators. So for supply, we've got the housing stock, whether it's single family or multifamily, how many construction starts, which is basically how many building permits have been pulled and how much land has been for sale. And then how many construction uh, projects have been completed and what the vacancy rate is. All of these can help us indicate where supply is at in a market. And then over here, we've got job growth. We look for a diverse employer base, population and household formation, and then some different population demographics, the age, sex, income, nationality, all those different things can help us figure out where the rental demand might be in a certain market. And then obviously the rental prices. You know, I know in, in some markets right now, you know, they're starting to offer a couple concessions here and there in some of the markets that I've seen. Um, you know, that's an indication that things are getting overbuilt, especially on the upper end, right? All these new buildings, especially in Boston and a lot of these places, you know, a three bedroom in Boston is going for $9,000 a month. I mean, that's insane. Yeah. So all that well, new build, um, go ahead, another thing, another thing too, too, is when you, you just look at what the lenders are doing and lenders more and more are starting to offer loans for people to buy properties that also include money for financing in the same loan. We haven't seen that for, for you know, probably 10 years. Um, and so those things are starting also I know more and more lenders who are late making loans for people who have credit scores in the 500s, 550, 520. It, whenever you see that starting to happen, that's always a pretty strong indicator that we're heading towards the end of a cycle and it's time to really think more about your strategy. I mean, for me personally, it's all about the rentals, you know. I mean, I've done a lot of flips, but flipping is, you know, it's definitely more cyclical. Like when you're coming out of a recession, obviously a great time to flip. But when you're starting to head into one, you're really, really taking some tremendous risk, you know. So um, rentals is where it's at, man, you know. Absolutely, 100%. Yep. Um, so some of the places that we can get this data. So I kind of break it down. You know what, I actually want to switch over. I'm going to pull up the book that I wrote just to kind of give you a little more context. So I kind of break it down, right, when, you, when you're looking at, if you're not, if you're looking beyond your back door and say, you know, I live in Boston, say I want to invest outside of Boston somewhere, where do I start? Well, I look at a macro level across the U.S. and how do I figure out which areas of the country are doing well? And a lot of these data sources that I'm listed right here, the Milken Institute Best Performing Cities Report, the ULI Emerging Trends in Real Estate, IR's Annual Viewpoint is great. It actually shows a graphic of where they think every single market is in the market cycle. Um, you've got Marcus and Millichap has a ton of great reports. Um, most of them are free. Um, the challenge that I found is that they're at most of the major metro areas. So, you know, you've got Boston, Miami, DC, San Fran, all these major areas. But if you want to get into a secondary or tertiary market, you're not going to find too much. But these are great places to start with from a macro MSA level. And let me see if I can pull up this. All right, so are you guys seeing this? Yeah, and we actually have a couple questions, so hang on one second here. Perfect. Okay, from Yoko. Hey, Yoko. Uh, Yoko's asking, will we receive these slides in an email? So Yoko, what will happen is tomorrow, Beverly's gonna send out a recording of this webinar, so you can go through this again and when it's recording, of course, you can stop and start wherever you want and take screenshots and things like that. But also at the end of the night, Yoko, uh, Mike's going to show you how you can get his book for free. So you'll get the book that he's going through now in any, any case. But thank, good question too. Okay, uh, Fassel's asking, hey, Fassel, how you doing, buddy? Um, by the way, I saw, I got it, you have got your schedule for a strategy call, Fassel. Can't remember the date, but we've got you set up. Okay, Fassel's asking, I was curious, do you have links for these reports? Or do we have to search for them? Yeah, I think, they Mike, are. these are all in the book. Is that right? Yep. So right here in the book, you guys will get a copy. You can click right here, and it'll pull them all right open for you. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so, keep going. I'm sorry for the 
No, that's okay. I'm glad people are asking questions. And basically, you know, I could have skipped all these slides because all this information is in this book. I just tried to put something together just from a presentation standpoint, but literally everything I've gone through is right in this book. So you guys will all get a copy of this um, after the fact. I'll send you a link. It's got the write-up and everything, so you can go through, read it, and um, it's got my contact info too if you got questions, so feel free to send me a note after the fact too. Okay. Well, guys like me are glad guys like you are around because I, you know, studied this in high school and college, and I learned that, you know, I, I, I love investing, but when it comes to this stuff, I, you know, I would I would rather pay for the information. So I'm just eternally grateful that you've done this, and for for, the, you know, I mean, the fact that you're a CPA and you've done this is just even better, and I think you've got a lot more to to offer the world. So I just, I mean, I think I speak for a lot of us when I say. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> you know? I, I appreciate it. It's, this was literally all in Evernote on my phone and on my computer. And one of my mentors who's got a bunch of units now, he was like, man, you need to put this in a PDF and like send it out because it sucks trying to find this information. So I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. no problem. I'll do it. Um, so, so he was all that Abby's stuff, guess. guys. Okay. Hey, Abby, uh, Abby just asked a question. Would you mind letting me know again how to obtain the book? So, Abby, at the end of the webinar tonight, Mike's going to show you how to get the book. We're all going to get a copy for free, um, or electronic version, I believe. So, uh, at the end, we'll go over that, Abby. So, um, good, to, good to see you, Abby, too. Okay. All right, Mike, go ahead. Sorry. Cool. So, um, the book's kind of broken down. So, this first section, step one, get a pulse on the MSAs across the nation. Again, if you're going to invest outside your backyard. Um, one of the things that my mentor taught me was real estate is local. So, you know, things could be doing very well in, say, Boston, and they could be going horribly in, say, Kansas City. So every market um, could be completely different, and it's important to really narrow in and figure out where, where you want to be. Um, so that's that. So then what you want to start to do is gather the data from these reports. And I'll go through a little bit more detail, but again, this is a free download. You can click on this. This is a template that I use. I've got some data that is a little bit old. I think this was from last year when I linked all this stuff, but you'll, you'll see how I filled it out. Uh, I think I got Dallas, Orlando, and then there was a local market in there too. It's kind of a template. You can see how I use it um, so that that way you can kind of evaluate and compare um, different MSAs in different cities side by side and see which ones make the most sense. So you can see it's got job growth, MSA population, projected annual job growth, the city population, the MSA five-year population growth. All this stuff I show you how to get in this book. As we keep going down, you'll see there's screenshots now with active links. So as I've reiterated over and over again, job growth is one of the most important indicators to find, historical job growth and projected job growth. And the place to get that is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I took some screenshots to show you exactly where to click. I've got links in here, exactly where to go to get the stuff. But you can see what I mean. Like trying to find this info in here was ridiculous. Um, so you, hopefully this saves you a ton of time and energy um, with having all these links in here. Now, I have not tested every single market. Selfishly, I've only used it for the markets that I want to invest in. Um, so if you're having a hard time finding it in your market, you know, let me know. I'm happy to try and help you help you figure it out. Okay. Uh, so as we go down, you know, a lot of this, the next few pages is literally you can see step by step. I tell you exactly what to click on, what links to go to, all through this detailed, detailed instructions. Population growth. We're going to go over to the Bureau of uh, the US Census. Now there's a lot of sites out there that um, you may have heard of where they definitely have a lot of good information but what I found is a lot of them are pulling data from the 2010 census. Now it's 2017 a lot's changed since 2010. So I know for me I want to have the most current data possible especially around population growth and job growth and all these different things so if I'm relying on stuff from 2010 when the market was pretty low and barely starting to recover, um, you know, that's probably not the best data to be using. So again, I walk you through step by step. 
um, how to search for a particular city um, using the fact finder on the census.gov website. Again, this is all just detailed instructions on exactly where to go. Community survey data. Hey, Mike. Yep. A couple more questions while you're scanning through that. Uh, Mary's Tablada is asking, what, what's MSA? It's a you... metropolitan statistical area. So it's a way that I think there's 388 MSAs. So when I say Boston, right, most people think of the city Boston, but the MSA of Boston includes Cambridge and, you know, a bunch of other different cities. It's more of a region. And I can't remember how they defined what the regions were, but if you Google, you know, Boston MSA or Kansas MSA or, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth is an MSA, so you've got Dallas-Fort Worth, um, a bunch of different areas within that MSA. It mm -hmm. stands for a Metropolitan Statistical Area. Okay, good. And then, uh, and here's the name you might recognize, Dan Ford. Hey, Dan. Dan and hey. I had a great call just earlier, so, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, Dan's asking, okay, is there a difference between buying flips and buying rentals in terms of where we are in the market cycle? Um, yeah, I think it depends on what your strategy is, right? So if I'm, if I'm going to buy an apartment with some investors and my plan is to go in there and do a, you know, a five to seven year hold where I'm forcing some appreciation and then I'm banking on refinancing or selling it, <coughs> You know, that's a totally different story than if I'm going to buy a property and hold it for cash flow for 30 years. Because at that point, if I'm going to hold it forever, I really yeah. don't care what the value is. I'm all about the cash flow. But if I have to refinance, that's right. all of a sudden the market tanks, Oops. that's, quite frankly, that's what I'm waiting for. Because hey, all those hey, Mike, if you can hear me, hang on one second. You're, um... oh, there you are. Are you still there? Yep. Uh-oh, am I losing you? Yeah, your audio your audio sort of caught a wave in there for a second. It looks like it sounds like you're back though. Okay. Could could be your internet connection. It might be. I'm, honestly, I'm uh, I'm actually in my basement because this is like my Hang son's. On one second, let me see now. here. It looks like we're okay on this end. Hang on, let me go to check. Yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes it takes a second, Mike, for you to get your. Um, uh, if you have other. Um, programs running on your computer, go go ahead and shut them down. That might help. Okay, Is that any better? I just closed here. down my internet browser. Oh, much better. Okay. Yeah. I apologize, guys. I'm okay. actually in my basement because it's my son's bewitching hour. So I'm sparing you the oh. <laughs> streaming of bedtime right now. Yeah. Um, you're, in the, you're, in the, you're in a dungeon. There you go. <laughs> yep. Uh, um, okay. So sorry, Dan. Um, your question about I don't know where it cut out, but you know it really depends on the strategy. Like Gary was saying, if if you're trying to flip a property near the top of the market, it's you know it, it's risky. Um, it, yeah. Unless you can buy it at a real good discount, you know it's all about what you buy it for. Yeah, yeah, Dan. I would I would tell you it, I, I didn't mean to sound like um, I was against flipping. You you can flip really almost any time. It's just there's more risk to flipping market timing risk. So if you're in a down cycle, if you're going from the top of the peak of the curve down to the bottom of the trough of the curve, that's a real danger trying to be flipping. I mean, people have done it. I've done it. It's just you got to really, really, really be careful and also be willing to take a lot of risk because your house might sit there for a long time before it sells. But if you're on the, the upward trend, if you're going from the trough to the, to the crest, um, obviously it's much easier to flip. Um, the, the funny thing is, is, well, it's not funny, but um, when it comes to rentals, you actually can pick up rentals in any market. I, I don't, I never stop buying rentals. I don't care if it's the trough or the the the, the crest or where we are. Um, everything's relative, you know. Um, so I rentals is always in a, a less risky bet. Okay, uh, Cedric's asking. Okay, was there a specific criteria that Michael used to select his markets to invest? Um, that's from Cedric Farrell. Cedric's in Orange County, California, um, just below. Um, um, so we got some other students out there, actually. Um, it's just below LA. But in any case, uh, maybe you or your mentor 
if you share that with you, Michael, um, you know, maybe an example of what he's using to know, because I know for me, I, I look at a lot of data. Um, and of course, Georgia, Texas are still really good areas, parts of Utah. Um, the obvious ones are always, you know, Ohio, Indiana, you know, Pennsylvania, uh, things like that. But as your Cedric's question is basically, do you have specific criteria? If you could show that, that would be awesome, you know? Yeah, so I was hoping, I thought I had it in here, but I, I don't have it in the book. But what I can tell you is, is <clears throat> he looks, as a general rule of thumb, right? You want job growth of 2% or more for the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, you look for, and again, it, it, so his strategy, right, these are syndications. So we're pooling money from investors. We'll buy a property that has some type of problem. We'll fix it. We'll force some appreciation, and then we'll sell it or refinance it in, say, five to seven years. So that's a totally different strategy if you're going to hold it long term. That being said, so what we'll look for is markets with 2% or more job growth. Um, markets that have at least 100,000 people in the MSA. Um, and that's just to keep the options open on the back end because if we go to sell it to an institution, you know, these are larger apartment complexes. So trying to figure out, you know, is, is MetLife going to buy a, a huge property in Amish land or are they going to go buy one in Dallas Fort Worth? So always trying to look at the back end. So good size population, um, a major airport with at least one major airline. Um, try and figure out where the good school districts are. Um, there's four different categories of properties. So A are these brand new beautiful complexes or you know beautiful brand new properties. B properties are about 10 years to 15 years old, um, kind of upper middle class-ish. Uh, you've got your C properties that are a bit older, um, kind of your working class blue collar type. And then you've got your D properties, or which are like war zones, and we don't we don't play around in those. Those are kind of the dangerous areas that you wouldn't want your uh, your loved ones to go pick up rent checks. Um, so we like to play in the B and C space. So the where the majority of the U.S. population is, right? So that that middle class um, B and C space. Um, what else we look for? Um, Population growth and household formations, again, right around that 2% mark uh, year over year for the last couple of years. These are all what he calls emerging markets, right? So these are markets that have been, kind of been stagnant, and then they're starting to show signs of, of growth. Um, in the book, I talk about how you can reach out to the local economic development committees and figure out what are they doing to attract new businesses. So there's a market right now, Boston, I don't touch because it's really overbuilt and it's getting very pricey. But there's a market about a, an hour south of Boston where I could pick up a six family for under 300000 And they've got a super active economic development committee. Amazon just built a million square foot facility. They've got all these tax incentives going in. And they're just really working to attract jobs and try and promote uh, growth within that city. That's what you're looking for. You want you want kind of those markets that are flying under the radar um, that have really good potential. Hope, okay. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that helps a lot. Oh, by the way, Kim just made a, we were talking about the family being the way she said, Kim says, I kicked my family out. <laughs> 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 um, okay, let's see, Yoko, everybody's asking their slides frozen. No, actually, you're right. We're on the, where it says chapter one, foundation of success in real estate, so that's the slide we're on. Oh, you can see it should be okay. Yeah. And Mike, back to you because we're all caught up on questions now. Awesome. Sorry, I've been, I got a little ADD, so I kind of skip around on these things as I'm talking. Um, That's so okay. As we, <laughs> as we uh, come back, we talked about population growth. Uh, what else we got in here? We talked about, okay, I think we left off here to try and get demographics, right? So on average, if you had to, if you had to guess, if I asked you right now, you know what's kind of the sweet spot for renters? And typically, you're looking at say 22 to 40. You know, is maybe 22 to 35, as some of the millennials are waiting a little bit longer to actually buy a property. That's kind of a, a sweet spot. And then it, again, it depends on the market. If you're in, you know, down in Florida somewhere, the demographics are going to be a little bit older, or 
you know, it depends, but you need to know your market and figure out who, who's your ideal customer, just basic marketing. Who do I, who do I want to serve? Um, so this is coming in and getting kind of your, your demographics, your population. There you go. So here's all the ages and kind of the breakdown of percentages of this. Uh, this is actually Dallas, Texas. So you've got a pretty even spread. So 25 to 34 years old is about 18 and a half percent of the population there. So that's a pretty solid renter base just even in, in that um, age group. And then we come down to job diversity. That was one thing that I didn't mention before, but we always look for a diverse employment base because if, if a uh, city's economy is based on one massive company just pumping in jobs. If that company leaves, you're left holding the bag because yeah. everybody or else. Too. Exactly, an in industry, right? Detroit, the auto industry. You know, they're making a good comeback, but you know that place was desolate. Yep. Um, you, you guys would be amazed if anybody, if any of you haven't traveled, you're gonna, you'd be pleasantly surprised to see what's happening in places like Detroit and Buffalo. I mean, Pittsburgh kind of went through their renaissance way long time ago, and they're diversified now. They've got high tech, um, higher education, um, you know, medical, strong medical, really good recession-proof industry. And, and, and by the way, the reason why high education is really important is because, oddly enough, in a recession, college and university enrollment actually increases. If you look at those numbers over the over history, they actually increased during recession. Um, and of course, medical systems, hospital systems, you know, people, doesn't matter if the economy is good or bad. People are always getting sick and getting injured. You know, so those are good, stable industries. You know, um, yeah, the Cleveland's okay. Cleveland's hanging on. You know, Pittsburgh. So I, and I can't really speak directly to Cleveland, although I've been there a number of times. Um, they still have pretty high unemployment, but man, Detroit. In Buffalo, just really, really pleasantly surprising areas right now, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we got a few more questions. Hang on one second. Let's see what's rolled in here. Um, okay, this is from Fassel. Fassel's from Northern New Jersey. And he's asking, uh, uh, just curious, how many units do you have currently and how did you find funding? Um, hey, Fassel, we, a uh, couple things here. I'm, I'm right, working on another publication to talk about alternative sor sources of funding, alternative uh, ways to finance the purchase of properties. And also we have a guest speaker coming in December. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning of the session tonight, he's a private lender from New York and they lend and I believe in all 48 of the lower 48 states uh, to help you get funding for you and your for your investors. Uh, but Mike, if you have anything to add to that, obviously feel free. In yeah, time. absolutely. So I've been in the game for about five years now. I've done everything from investing in single families. Uh, I did a duplex development deal. And when I wanted to get into, into multifamily, into the large apartment complexes, um, you know, I struggled for about two years. You know, I was putting in offers, um, but the markets were really hot that I wanted to get into. And I just, I couldn't get anything accepted because I didn't have a track record. I had some investors that I had lined up. Um, based on my profession as a CPA, I was fortunate, and based on some of the folks that I've met in mastermind groups um, that I've developed relationships with. So what I ended up doing was I ended up um, partnering up with another company that um, has about 2,600 units, primarily in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And what we do now is they handle all the operations, and then I help raise some of the equity for their deals. So technically, I mean, I can say the team has 2,600 units. I don't own all that, but as an operation, um, there's a lot of doors down there. So that was one way that I kind of leveraged other teams. And now I'm, like I was telling Gary, I've been exploring some other things around vacation rentals. And it's all about cash flow, man. Whatever you want to invest in and however you got to do it, it's just finding cash flow. Yep. Um, and then Abby's asking, oh, she might have been a few minutes late. She's asking, uh, may I ask what is the speaker's name and which office? <laughs> so uh, you go ahead and repeat your name, Mike, and then the name of your company, you know? Sure. Um, so my name is Mike Shogren, and uh, I've got a couple companies. One of them is SNA Capital. That's our multifamily investment um, firm. And then uh, my most recent firm is called Occupied, and that is a vacation rental company. Okay. 
Thanks. And let's see, this is from uh, another question from Abby. Hang on one second. It's a long one. Let me go back to the beginning. Okay. Uh, Abby's saying, my, my potential buyer is considering to invest in Boston to buy rental properties for Chinese tenants. Uh, the landlord is considering to live in one of the units, multiple family, three deckers, a duplex, both can take into the consideration. Their budget is around one to two million. So, um, as she, I, I know Abby personally, but she's, do um, uh, you know um, Ryan Snow, Michael? He helped write the book um, Miracle Mornings with How Run for Salespeople. Yep. So Abby's yeah, in his guy. market center. He is a really awesome dude. Um, you know, maybe uh, once Abby gets this, is there a way for her to, and I know you're going to go over this at the end, but maybe they can contact you. She's, she's really serious about what particular areas, like you just mentioned one south of Boston that might be a good area for her, for her client. You know? Yeah. Feel um, free. Actually, I'm happy to, uh, to touch base and, and help in any way. Good. And she just, that was her follow-up question actually, is what, what questions do you recommend in your opinion? Um, so Abby, look for, look for, just follow up through to the end, Abby, and you'll get some information. You'll figure out how to look at this yourself and also perhaps be able to contact um, Michael afterwards. Um, and Fassel saying thank you. So you're, well, you're, uh, you're welcome, Fassel. So, okay, Michael, uh, back to you, man. Awesome. Yeah, and one other thing too, I know the, the, the big challenge too is, and some of it's, a lot of it's mindset is around coming up and finding the money. And I know, Gary, you're a big advocate of, of finding ways to use your own money without investors initially, and I completely agree with that. And, um, you know, uh, I got used to living on a certain income before, you know, waking up to the whole passive income stream. So I started adding side hustles. You know, so I've got a few other businesses that I enjoy doing that make me a, a sizable profit that goes straight to, to real estate. And I'll, I'll talk to you on a little bit more about a course that I put together around that at the end. But, you know, there's always ways. There's always ways to, to, to make things happen if you want it bad enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah I, I obviously, my, my preference is start with cash. I know, it, I know that ruffles a lot of feathers, but the fact is, is boy, when you're on cash, you... you <laughs> You're you're living free, you know. It's it's just um, you know, you get the there's an old saying in business, the golden rule. The golden rule in business is the guy with the gold makes the rules, you know. Um, it's getting there that's the challenge. And so, this next thing I'm going to be publishing here in probably the next several months is, you know, alternative methods to finance. Um, I just want people to view that as as, as a as a uh, interim step, um, just a way to get them in the game. And then once they're in the game leverage as much as they can to, to get, you know, their, their sweat equity, things like you're doing might generate other, other businesses um, and generate other sources of cash flow so that you're more independent. That, that's really my philosophy. I, you know, sometimes people think I'm a real hard ass when it comes to borrowing. And I guess I technically am, but, but um, would people from the outset borrow to get into the properties and they're, and they're borrowing from everybody they can to get into a property usually translates into very little equity, low equity positions, which usually also means I can guarantee they got low cash flow. And it, what happens is they end up staying in that rut for, for a long period of time, you know. Um, hey, by the way, we've got a question here from Paul. So let me, uh, Paul Sheehan. Hey, Paul. Uh, Paul's from Toronto, by the way. And he says, what are Michael's side hustles? Um, He's, he's curious what the, and I think you kind of talked about him briefly, but um, if you want to say that to the end, Michael, I know you're going to have some other things to go over. It's up to you, you know, so. Yes. Um, Paul, I will, why don't we hold that and I'll talk about it at the end. Um, but it, I guarantee it's nothing of, of what people would think. It has nothing to do with accounting, nothing to do with finance, just something that I enjoyed doing and I found a way to make really good money doing it. So. I'll leave you hanging a little bit, but we'll talk about it at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, no, we're, yeah, we're all caught up. Sorry, Mike. It's all, all no. caught up and all yours. Yep. Awesome. Um, so, again, I know this kind of been going through this, but um, job diversity, touched on that a little bit. This is how you figure out um, who the primary employee or what industries are there. So, again, you can see down in this box on the lower right, Dallas-Fort Worth area, it's got a good mix of a bunch of different industries, and you can figure this out for you know, whatever MSA you're looking at. 
But ideally, as Gary mentioned, you know, you want to have a nice, diverse employer base because if it's based too heavily on, on military or um, auto or you know one particular type of industry or one major employer, if that employer moves, you know, it it pulls a lot of jobs out of that market and it kind of leaves the market stagnant and in decline. Yeah. <laughs> And then the big one, a key indicator is obviously vacancy rates. And this one took me a little while to find, um, but this is huge. It's very important to figure out what the, uh, what the vacancy rates are and where they're trending in your market. Um, again, as a general rule of thumb, some folks were asking questions about what my mentor looks for. In what he calls his emerging markets, he tries to get into a market when it's 89 to 90% occupied. Um, as far as occupancy rates, I should say, in various apartment buildings, because on average, um, over the course of time, the average market occupancy should be 95%. So right there alone, you know, you've got a 5% increase um, just waiting for you as the market corrects. So that's just another little area that he looks at. Um, let's see. Construction permits, again, looking at the supply side of things. This is kind of your crystal ball into the future, right? So if you know that there's 100,000 units available right now, but there's another 30,000 coming in the pipeline over the next two years, okay, well, how, what's job growth looking like over the next two years? Are they going to overbuild, or is, you know, does the market still have legs, as they say? So that's construction permits. And then kind of going beyond the numbers. So in the book, I give you this script that I've used. I mentioned talking to economic development committees. Um, I've got some great information using this um, script. You don't have to go through the whole thing at once because they might feel like you know, you're interrogating them, but here's some questions um, that I've used. You know, some of them are as simple as, you know, can you give me an overview of what's going on in the city as far as job growth, new property developments, et cetera? Um, you could ask them for the city's master plan and get a copy of that. I've gotten that in a few cases. It's a good sign if the plan is updated and they're actually making progress on it. I've seen other cities um, where the plan's 15 years old and they haven't touched it. So obviously that's not a very active economic development committee. Um, you know, are they sticking to the plan? Has the city been able to meet its goals? What industries are coming in? You know, I mentioned that market I was looking at. Amazon just came in. A bunch of other um, big name businesses just came in. Um, they're building a new outdoor plaza. You know, all these different indicators that you know they're pulling in jobs. They're trying to revitalize this city. Um, are there any revitalization zones or any tax advantaged areas or programs? So again, are they offering different incentives? You know, giving away free land or huge tax incentives for companies to come in and tear down those old warehouses? And put up new, you know, offices or apartments. Um, how's the relationship between the business community and the state and local government? This can be huge. Uh, my mentor got his real success. I mean, he started buying two and three family apartments on uh, on credit cards, and then the values took off when um, the city put in a train line into Boston. So he was buying up properties in this this town called Brockton, which was pretty ghetto back in the day. It still can be a little spotty here and there, but once once the Economic Development Committee got active, they got a new mayor, he put in five new schools, they got a train line into Boston, and the value of his properties tripled within the two-year period. So, you know, it, all these little things that you can look for and use this script, or at least some of these questions to reach out, and, you know, typically they're pretty friendly. You know, if, if they think you're a serious buyer, they need investors like us to come in to find these old properties and fix them up so that they can, you know, improve the city. So they're more than happy to, to talk to you, to take you out to lunch, you know, to see what you're up to and, and what you're looking for. And then once you go through and you're, you're getting a little more serious, you can get a listing of all the properties in the market. So I actually just did this for my vacation rental business. I went to a city that I was looking at. Um, I went to the tax assessor's office. Sometimes you might have to pay a fee. I think the most I've paid is 30 bucks. This latest town, they just gave it to me for free. Um, I basically go in and I ask them for all these different things. I say, hey, you know, how you doing? I'm, 
I'm an investor. I'm looking for these types of properties. And um, you know, could you print me out the listing of all the properties and here's all the information that I need. It's all public record. Most of it um, is just automated to our system. So it's just the matter of a clerk running a report and printing it out or ideally I would get it in Excel because then you can manipulate it and use uh, different filters to kind of filter out information or take notes and add columns and all those things. So I'll, I'll usually get it in Excel. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of counties too. Um, you can actually order online a disk of yes. their tax assessor database, and I've done that a lot of times. Sometimes it's fifty bucks, sometimes it's thirty. You know, a lot of times you can actually go online, and and you would have to finagle it, but sometimes you can find everything you want directly online for free. You know, it's just you don't get the the reason I like getting the CD is the data is parsed. So I can I can import it to like an Excel spreadsheet and do all kinds of searches and um, sort merging all mailings all kinds of neat things and it's just worth the fifty bucks to be able to do that you know absolutely absolutely and that way too you know you can start whether you're an agent or an investor you know I've used this to to do direct mail campaigns I'll figure out you know who based on certain criteria may have owned the property for 30 years well that property is probably free and clear at this point maybe they're open to some creative financing or maybe they're looking to unload it or you know if I see one that might be in a family trust maybe they've inherited it um, you know you can get a little creative I mean there's also list broker services that you can get a lot of these things but if you're if you're just looking to get some solid free information for the most part or even at a minimal cost, um, this has worked pretty well for me. The other thing, once I get serious about um, a certain area, I'll just do what uh, what they call about you know driving for dollars. I'll just drive around the area, and then I'll shop some of the properties. So I don't know if you can see. So when I was, I guess I'll hide those. But when we were looking at a deal in in Dallas Fort Worth. Um, I flew down and I went and shopped all these properties. So these are all comps for the property that we bought. And I basically just, I tell them, hey, you know, I'm, my name's Mike. Um, I'm from Boston. I'm looking to relocate down here. And I just tour it as if I'm going to rent the place. And what I'll typically say is, you know, I want to get at least the data on the one and two bedrooms. If I can find a way to finagle to getting data on three bedrooms without, um, coming across as a quote unquote shopper, um, I'll do that. But what I'll say is, I think I have it in here. Yeah. Um, you know, how much are the one bedroom units? And they'll say, you know, whatever. And then I'll say, oh, okay, well, what if I wanted a two bedroom? How much are those going for? And it's just as simple as that. And then I'll just jot down all these notes. I'll get a pamphlet from the property. So I'll get the square footages. So I have all this information in here. What's the rent? What's the square foot? Now I know what the rent per square foot is. And um, I'll take some notes about the property condition, the neighborhood, the concessions, and then any other notes over here. Um, so that's just um, another little tool that you can use. Kind of go out and shop your market. If you're looking at smaller properties, just go on Craigslist. I've been doing this lately for the vacation stuff. I'll just literally go and um, pretend like I'm going to rent a place and just check it out and see what places you're going for. Uh, let's see. And then, you know, obviously if the property's not in your backyard and you're still kind of feeling it out, you don't really have anything under contract yet and you're still testing the waters, um, you know, you can call the property and shop them over the phone and just say, Hey, I'm, I'm looking at possibly relocating. And, you know, at least you can get some pricing information and they can send you some pamphlets and everything. Just be prepared. They're going to follow up with you um, quite a bit if they're a good property management company anyway. Yep. Um, so just be prepared for that. That's a good thing because if they do, that means they're doing their job and maybe you can hire them to manage one of your properties going forward. Well, actually, that leads to a question from, um, let me check here. It's Yoko. Hey, Yoko. Or she's asking, okay, so is it normal to invest in places other than the state you reside and how do you find property management company in an unfamiliar area? So actually you just kind of touched on that. One of the things you can do, um, 
And also, Yoko, when you're first starting out investing, most people do just kind of invest right where you are in your own geographic area. I mean, it's just more comfortable. You can, it's just, you feel more in control. But over time, I mean, most of us do start investing outside our areas. I mean, for me, it was like a multi-step approach. Um, and you can also, uh, every every major area, that, you know, every MSA, is going to have usually a, a, a like an apartment association. It's not the investors club. It's actually an association, like you have a realtors association. Um, they'll have one for apartments, you know, property managers, and you can get you can call them and email them and get information. And even if you want to, if you go out there, go to one of their events, one of their meetings, and just start asking questions and ask people, you know, and then the names that pop up the most is that's those are the ones you want to reach out to and uh, kind of interview. Uh, but but Mike's showing you right here one tool you can definitely use and the ones that call you back, well those are those are probably pretty good property management companies, at least at least uh, on first sight, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's definitely challenging, especially on um, you know, anything over I'd say a hundred to hundred and fifty units, you can start getting into some of the bigger name management companies where you know they have systems and they're well trained and they're all certified and everything um, but finding I found that you know finding good quality managers for you know single families up to 20 units can be very challenging so if you find one interview them get references and if they're good you know hang on to them compensate them well yep okay okay it looks like we're caught up yeah, we're caught up there. Oh, oh, somebody's asking about the book, link for the book. Um, so we're going to, so if you have to leave early, this is, um, hey, Peggy, um, just get the recording tomorrow and the link. And, I will see, and also, Mike, if you can send that to Beverly, she'll put it in the in the follow-up email too. You know? Yep, I sent it to her today, so it should be uh, Okay, should good. Be awesome. Okay, and then that's, we're caught up on questions now, so yeah. Perfect. And then the last piece you know, as far as remote, you can use Google Street View. Um, I've done that to at least get a sense of the area. So, um, if you've have if you've never used Google Street View, check it out. It's pretty sweet. It's basically like a virtual tour. You can like drive up and down the street and click around and look at the different areas. You can zoom out, you know, to get a an aerial view and then zoom in. Um, obviously, it's best to to get down there. But if you're kind of contemplating um, a different market you can check out Google Street View and that'll give you a sense of the area at a high level. And then at the at the very end I've got a bunch of different um, resources that I've used you know from my website to area development, bigger pockets, Bureau of Labor Statistics, CoStar, LoopNet, a um, bunch of book recommendations, um, podcast recommendations, all these things that you know I've I've used for a number of years now and that's all included in here and then just here's all my contact info so everybody can get uh, get a copy of this Let's see if I can if this doesn't mess anything up I'm just gonna try and get the link to, uh, to post it in the comments here and then Beverly will include it in the email tomorrow too okay yeah this is from um Shan Barton, she, let's see, Shan is asking, okay, Mike, can you give us some info about the vacation rental business, please? Um, sure. <laughs> it's kind of vague, but um, I've recently been introduced to it um, by some friends and um, some fellow folks in the mastermind group, and um, I'm looking at a couple of units this weekend up in the White Mountains in New Hampshire, and the uh, what I've been seeing is, you know, again, it's all on cash flow, and the cash flow is phenomenal um, in the right market. And a, another business model I'm contemplating is actually around master leases. So rather than, you know, the property I'm looking at this weekend, it's 180000 to buy it, right? So that means I got to come up with, say, 40 to put down, including closing costs, and then I want to put another 10 to 15 into it. So say I'm in it for 55. Okay, well, if I rent that place on a yearly basis, it's say 1500 bucks a month, 
I need first last security. So what's that? Forty five hundred bucks, and then I don't know ten grand to furnish it. So I could control that property, and then sublease it uh, on a short short term basis, and pretty much net the same cash flow. So I could get I could control five properties, as opposed to just one. Um, now you're not building up equity that way. Um, but it's something that I'm, I'm toying with right now because right now in my, at this stage in my life, I'm all about cash flow and financial freedom. Um, because what I want to do is generate as much cash flow as possible right now. So when the markets do correct, I want to be in a cash position to buy as much as possible. So, you know, in certain areas in my backyard that are overheated right now, I want to be in a position when the market corrects and everybody else is running for the hills saying real estate's a terrible investment. I want to be that guy backing up the truck and buying as much as I can. Yeah, just like Warren Buffett says, when a herd goes left, we should be going right, you know? 100%. 100%. Yeah, so, um, yeah I mean, if, if you've got specific questions around vacation rentals, again, I, I, I'm fairly new to it. I'm testing it out. Um, but I definitely plan to scale that into a full-blown um, investment business for sure. Okay. All right. So we're we're sitting here a little bit after 8.07, so we're okay, Mike. I mean, as long as you're okay, um, sometimes we do go long like this, but um, yeah, you got a lot of, we got a lot of questions tonight, so I wasn't surprised. I knew with this, when you were coming on, we were going to generate a lot of interest, so. Um, awesome. Uh, Awesome subject, and you, everybody can see your your email there too, Michael at snacap.com. Um, so, in any case, so go ahead and uh, floor, floor your floor is yours. Awesome. So, um, again, I'll make sure everybody gets a copy of this book for free. And there were some folks that were asking about some of the the side hustles that I've done, and um, what I've done, as I mentioned, you know, my formal background is a CPA. Um, I've studied money, finances, and wealth for over a decade now. Um, it's been my career. And what I decided to do was because a lot of my friends, quite frankly, they asked me a lot of questions about finances and money and how I'm doing all these things. So what I did is I put together a, what I call a, a seven day boot camp or a seven day financial transformation where I lay out all my systems on how I did exactly everything. So from day one of getting the right mindset, to day two, figuring out where I am financially. So I built a financial scorecard to show where I am. Um, right there on paper, it's black and white. You know, what's my financial picture look like? Um, where do I want to get to? What's my financial freedom number? Um, you know, a lot of people say that they want to be financially free, but what does that look like to you? Do you need three grand a month, five grand a month, 10 grand a month, 50 grand a month? What does that look like to you? And then, you know, I built out a plan to, to get to that point and I go through um, how I built a couple of these side hustles. So, um, let's see if I can pull it up. I don't know if you guys are seeing this anymore, but. We see clue. Um, so, there we go. Data sources. Okay. Yeah. So what I did is I put together this course, but the side hustle that I started was about four years ago, I'd always been into photography, and I actually started a full-blown commercial, uh, commercial photography studio where all I do is photograph apartments. So I literally shop the competition, and I get paid to do it, and I get paid a, a good amount of money. Um, and between that and some other um, affiliate things that I've done, you know, this year alone, I've generated over 35000 on the side. And that all is just going to go to real estate. And I, I show you whether you like photography or not is irrelevant. But what I do is I show you how to figure out what you're good at. There's a couple skills assessment things that are in there. And we figure out what you're good at and how to profit from it. And I go through 10 different um, ideas or different um, subjects that you could profit from. Um, doing things that you already like doing. And then kind of setting up a business plan how you're going to get your first customers. And the goal is to start generating at least $1,000 a month through this plan. And again, we're all here because we love real estate. So my hope is that you're going to take that money. And then on the last day, I go through kind of my process on underwriting different deals. 
um, on how to buy real estate. Now it's not a full blown real estate course. You're already here with Gary. You don't need that. He's got way more experience than I do in that department, but it's a high level overview. But my course is designed to get you automating all your finances. So you're never worried about any of that stuff. Even as a CPA, you know, finances can be stressful. And I found a way to just automate everything years ago. I've got a six bucket system that I use now that I share in the program that literally everything's automated. So, you know, I don't, I don't have to worry about that. And then I have all these different systems now where I'm generating extra income, I'm sourcing deals and you know, I'm actively working towards my goal every single day. And we're getting to the end of the year now, you know, everybody's going to be planning their goals. And, um, this is just a way that I've found that actually helps me take action towards those goals, especially financially. So, um, I told well, Gary you. that I would do like a nice little bonus for you guys, just because you're obviously an action taker. We're all kind of aligned. We love real estate. We see the potential in it. And, um, I'm just, I'm happy to be here and help out. And this is just another way to help, you know, generate some extra income that you can put towards creating, you know, your portfolio. Yep. Well, we'll tell you this, you know, whether you've got a dollar or a million dollars, you, you definitely have to have goals and you definitely have to have a plan. And the irony is, is if, if you only have a dollar, you may think, well, I don't need a plan. But if you don't have a plan and you only have a dollar, you will always only have a dollar. You're not going to get to a million without a plan. So understanding, you know, controlling your finances and measuring and tracking and and it's so vitally important. So, and the, and the more affluent you are, the more critical, the, the more robust your plan is. It's just, um, you know, everything's relative. Like people say, well, if I become a, a multi-millionaire, I won't no longer have any problems. You, you will have problems. You actually have bigger problems. You know, people who are more successful financially still have problems. They just have bigger problems, but they also have the plan to go with it. Um, so everything's relative. So I would encourage everybody to, you know, if, I'm not sure what you're, Mike, it looks like, well, here you go. Okay, so you've got another another thing coming up. Um, so let's talk about this because I wanted these guys to see this and see, you know, what's possible to help them because a lot of them, they have the information, they have the strategies. Uh, they, they just, they struggle because everything's not, they don't have a, a cohesive plan of action that includes and involves all facets of their of their financial life. In other words, what, how much money they're making from their jobs, how much they're saving in 401ks, how much they're investing in real estate, um, how much their debt is and how much the debt's costing them. Um, so something like this, I think it'd be vital. So go, let me quit talking. You go ahead and, and uh, get, get into it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if enough folks, um, you know, have questions or they're curious, you know, we can definitely do a separate call and, and go through any questions in more detail that you have. But this is kind of the course curriculum at a high level, right? So day one, we kind of go through your mindset. We figure out, you know, what's your money blueprint, right? I grew up in a blue collar home. My parents are some of the hardest working people I know. Um, but every Saturday, my father's out spending the whole day mowing the lawn, taking care of everything. And my neighbor across the street is a business owner and somebody comes and cuts his lawn and he spends Saturday with his family. And it was always looked at that, you know, he was lazy. Hmm. Is he lazy? I don't think so. He's probably making, he values his time and he's making a lot more money. You know, as an example with the photography, right? I could, I could go out and generate, I could take a photo shoot and generate anywhere from $800 to $3,000 on a, on a weekend doing a photo shoot. Does it make sense for me to spend that time doing that or to save a hundred bucks by cutting the lawn myself? So you got to look at that. What's your time worth and, and what are you doing with your free time? Um, so for day two, we talk about the four building blocks of wealth and we give you this financial scorecard. So this is literally, we're going to walk through exactly where you are financially. And you're going to need to do this, especially if you're going to buy a property regardless, because the bank's going to want to know, you know, what, what are you looking like right now financially before I lend you all this money? So we come up with this financial scorecard and then I show you how to automate it and track it with Mint. It's just a system that I use, so I have it on my phone. I know every day exactly what my financial picture looks like right on my phone. Um, day number three is figuring out your financial freedom number and 10 different ways to cut expenses. Um, 
these are not your typical different ways to cut expenses. You know, this is more thinking outside of the box and just figuring out what's important to you. Now, day four, we get into my six bucket system. Um, some of you may be familiar with this system that we've used in uh, one of the mastermind groups. I've taken it, tweaked it a little bit. Um, been using this for a while. It's worked well for me. So again, this is all about automating. When money comes in, where is it going? And you'll see that it's actually a very freeing exercise because you're never worrying about this stuff anymore. It just goes where it's supposed to go. And then here's where the fun starts, where a lot of these questions were about tonight. Um, how to boost your income with a side hustle. So I go through my story, how I started that whole photography business, how that evolved, um, where it's at today, um, some of the other businesses that I'm doing now, and then the importance of knowing yourself and going through these different assessments that I've supplied for you guys to really figure out who you are. And these were actually very eye-opening for me. Gary, it was pretty funny that um, when we were talking about doing all the market research, you know, that stuff is so painful for me. It's mm -hmm. so painful. And now I don't, you know, but I knew that it would add value. But it was funny. I always thought that, you know, I'm a CPA. I'm a detailed guy. I like doing all these things. But it really made me focus and figure out, you know, what are the things that I enjoy doing? And um, how does my personality type mix with certain types of activities? And what's going to be what's going to be the most profitable and what's going to be the most productive and, you know, obviously what's going to make me happy at the end of the day. Um, and then these two are very important. So three keys to a successful side hustle. Um, this is something that I've, I kind of put together after the fact. As I look back now, I can see that I stumbled across this. You know, I didn't plan it, but it just happened to work out that way. And now anytime I get into a new business, there's three key elements um, that I really look for before I actually launch anything. And I'm always trying to find the biggest spread. Just as a little tidbit, a little free rule of thumb, right? If I was, some of you are saying, wait, you're charging that much to photograph a property? My, my real estate photographer will charge me 100 or 150 bucks. You're 100% right. And that's why I do not do um, residential homes anymore. I did when I started. But now I only do large apartment complexes because the brokers that are paying me two to three grand to do that, they're going to make half a million to a million in commission on that sale. So find the spread. Where's the biggest spread in whatever side business you're going to look for? That's just a little tidbit. Um, day six is debt is actually your friend. Good debt is your friend. So I go through an exercise on how to automate your um, paying down your bad debt. So if you've got you know, TVs and all this crap on a credit card, um, this video will help you kind of smash that debt methodically um, and automated. And there's a way to track it and it'll show you when you'll be able to pay it off based on certain uh, payments that you're going to make. And it'll just help you put it on paper and kind of get it out of your mind. Um, we get into OPM, other people's money. And then there's another video called on debt it on how to automate everything. And then day seven is all about becoming a 100 percenter. And what a 100 percenter is, is when you can pay all of your living expenses purely from passive income. That's when you're a 100 percenter. That's when you don't have to go back to work anymore because your, your rental properties are just pumping out enough cash flow that it pays all your bills. So that's the goal is to get to that point. And then everything on top of that is just, it's just gravy then it's just living the, the lifestyle that you want. And then we go through, you know, the net worth versus cash flow method, what I call the ideal investment. And then I've got, you know, you guys are already getting a bunch of this stuff, but you've got the book here and then I've got some resources, how to build that team. So somebody who's asking how to build a team outside of your area, I go through that in this video, um, know the property and, you know, again, this is not a real estate course, but this is just setting up your foundation and then finding ways to generate extra income to pour into real estate. And then I've got a couple bonuses in here, the whole home buying process. Many of you are obviously familiar with that. And I got to do a really cool interview with um, a mutual friend of ours, Len Giancola, who's got a booming vacation rental business, actually. Um, I love his business model. He goes through it in... Uh, 
in this video. It's just genius. He talks about adding adding legs to his core business. So he just he has a core business and then he just he keeps adding legs to it. So it's just this revolving door of revenue. So it's a really cool interview. Um, and that's it. It's a seven day. It's a I wanted something concise um, that I could just help some folks through some of the guys that I've been working with um, have gotten a lot out of it and it's nice because it's systematic and it's quick um, and as I mentioned you know I sell this course for 997 now and I told Gary I wanted to, to offer it to you guys I'm doing 80% off so you guys will get it for 197 if you're interested either way whether you get the course or not if you've got questions about you know market research and all those types of things feel free to reach out to me you know like I mentioned at the beginning I, I love talking to folks um, like you guys because we're all we all we're all aligned. We know what we want. We know that you know this vehicle, this investment vehicle, can get us there, and we're all marching towards that. And that's why we're here with Gary. So um, again, I'm just super super grateful to Gary for having me on to to talk to you guys. And you know that's that's it. Okay. So the, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so. This does Beverly have this too to send in the follow-up email so if people want to participate they can click on that link yes um, okay okay good and then this will be obviously in the recording too hey by the way we do have a, a follow-up question fast was asking um, do you practice CPA for real estate clients um, in other words are you are you actively uh, providing accounting services for outside clients I guess particularly real estate folks not anymore. I did for many years, and that's kind of what got me triggered. Now I actually work um, for an international energy company, kind of handling their transactions. Okay. But I do, if, if folks are looking for recommendations, I have a phenomenal um, tax guy that handles a lot of real estate stuff, to be completely okay. honest with you guys. So. Okay. All right. So they'll, they're going to get your, your contact information, um, this link here if they want to, to have a financial plan um, as well as everything else that was in there too um, I think that's pretty much it we're getting a lot of a lot of thank yous here and so like hang on one second <coughs> um, yeah everybody's saying thank you thank you thank you um, great great attendance tonight too by the way and pretty very active crowd um, and awesome content I can't wait for uh, you know people to get to see this stuff you know uh, absolutely yep um, so they'll get so an email Beverly's going to send out. They'll get a link for the book, a link if they want to sign up. And you said it was you're only you're only offering that. That's only going to be two hundred bucks. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, one ninety seven for everybody. So yeah. and there's a thirty. I do the you know I do the thirty day guarantee too. So mm -hmm. again, it's all about just trying to help some folks open up and try and create this plan because I know you know finances is probably the the number one area, especially in families that they fight over, and it's just kind of a taboo yeah. topic so yeah I agree we are you're getting a lot of thank yous here Kim's uh, which is unbelievable information thank you so very much um, yeah thank awesome. you looking forward to this is from hang on a second here Abby okay Abby's thank you uh, looking forward to talking to you soon uh, thank you and take care of yourself keep yeah Bill Kenny um, Okay, awesome. Well, listen, Mike, I think it sounds like I speak for everybody here. We really do want to thank you for taking your precious time to do this. I know you're, you've are you got a family and you've got a young one that's, that's maybe in bed, maybe not. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And um, you're down in your basement, but you shared a lot of really awesome content. And, uh, you know, maybe sometime in the future we can have you back on. Or if you ever need me to do something for – for you and your guys, obviously, please let me. I know I'll see you eventually. I was hoping to get to Steamboat, but I, I'm still holding out a little bit of hope that I can rearrange things. Um, it just I've already signed myself up for some other, um, you know, masterminds and then like a Rio cruise in February and things like that. Um, so I've got to be careful what I what I do now. But I've never I've never missed an annual uh, Go Abundance event yet. This, if I miss this year, it'll be the first one. It's just I didn't know what the date's going to be until. That's it already committed to these other things. But regardless, I know I'll see you. Um, of course, we communicate on a regular basis. But thanks again, man, for doing this. Um, My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate everybody's questions and, and being engaged. And uh, just keep taking action. I just wish you guys the best. And feel free to reach out with any questions. You got it. Well, listen, Mike and everybody else, um, God bless you all. God bless your families. Um, 
we will see you next week. It'll be actually Monday night. I'll be in uh, Detroit, I think. I might try to drive back to London, Ontario for the night because I'm going to be bringing my uh, my uh, Peggy and her daughter down to the States for, for American Thanksgiving early early Tuesday. So uh, but in any case, um, Monday night, um, and then look for the announcement for December special guest. So thanks again, everybody, especially you, Mike, and you guys have a wonderful night. <coughs> okay, bye-bye.